Good morning, and welcome to the PLUS Therapeutics KOL event. At this time, all attendees are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentations. If you'd like to submit a question, you may do so by using the Q&A text box at the bottom of the webcast player, or by emailing your questions to questions at lifesidevisors.com. As a reminder, this call is being recorded and a replay will be made available on the PLUS website following the conclusion of the event. I'd now like to turn the call over to Corey Davis, Managing Director at Lifesci Advisors. Please go ahead, Corey. Uh, thanks, Tara, and thanks to everyone for joining us on this call to discuss the new data that was presented at the SNOW conference a few days ago. It uh, will be my pleasure in a second to turn the call over to Dr. Mark Hedrick, the CEO of Plus Therapeutics, but I'd also like to welcome the three KOLs that we have joining us on this call. We have Dr. Andrew Brenner, who is a professor, Department of Medicine, Neurology, and Neurosurgery at the University of Texas Health San Antonio. We have Dr. John Floyd, um, also professor at University of Texas San Antonio. And we have Dr. Toro Patel, who's at the University of Southwestern Medical Center. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Corey. And, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. If you go to the next, uh, I think two slides or three slides, uh, uh, please, Tara. Next, one more. One more, there you go. Okay, perfect, thank you. So uh, the agenda is that I will speak uh, briefly and just give, provide an overview of the company. And then, uh, and then Dr. Floyd and Dr. Patel and Dr. Brenner will talk about convection enhanced delivery and then talk about case planning and how we, um, how we affect the treatment on a patient. And then we'll go over the most recent data that was reported uh, just this past week at the Society for Neuro-Oncology Conference in Vancouver, Canada. So just a little bit about the company. Uh, those of you that follow the company know that uh, our focus is on developing targeted radiotherapeutics for patients with, with CNS cancers. And um, we have sort of the crazy goal that we could take these the very deadly cancers and turn them into chronic diseases like many cancers have now become. To do that, we've assembled a number of technologies in the targeted radiotherapeutic drug development space to, to both be where we are today and then kind of look to the future and what we might do downstream. Our two lead indications are for recurrent glioblastoma, which we'll focus on today, and the other is for leptomeningeal cancer, which is about 10 times more common. In the aggregate, these represent very significant uh, U.S. market opportunities. Thus far, we've shown what I think is very compelling survival signals in these two trials. And we'll focus on what we know today about the phase one and phase two glioblastoma trials. But I could mention that at the SNOW ASCO meeting in August, we showed a 10 month median overall survival early in the phase one uh, for, for patients that uh, have about a four to six week uh, life expectancy with no treatment. It's a very difficult disease with, with nothing approved. The company continues to be in, in solid financial footing. Um, we're, we're, we benefit from over $15 million in grant funding from the NIH and CPRIT, um, the state of Texas. And um, we have a number of other programs and trials that are, are in development. Next slide, please. Thank you. So first, a little bit about the technology. So rhenium obispameda is a three-part drug. It contains a rhenium-186 isotope that has very unique properties. And those will be illustrated both in my slides and, and throughout the uh, remainder of the, of the, the panel today. Uh, but it's rhenium that's uh, chelated by a small molecule and then loaded into a 100 nanometer liposome. And what, what that sort of three-part drug formulation does is it just fundamentally changes the, the pharmacokinetic properties of the drug. And, and that um, uh, the rubber meets the road really in two specific things. First is tumor retention, in that you put the drug uh, via convection enhanced delivery into the brain. It, it stays in place and fully delivers all its radiation throughout the decay cycle. So there's essentially no systemic toxicity. And the second thing is that it, it, it moves through, it conv or convects through the brain 
uh, in a in a very positive way and distributes throughout the tumor very well with that formulation versus uh, drugs that are much smaller or small molecules. Next slide, please. So CNS cancers are quite radiosensitive. The problem with external beam radiation, which has been the standard of care uh, for these patients for, for decades, is it's limited in the amount of dosage you can give to patients. It requires fractionation, multiple trips to the radiation oncology suite, and, and off-target toxicity fundamentally limits how much of the radiation you can give. Molecularly targeted radiation has promise, but still has the blood-brain barrier to contend with, and these are delivered systemically. Um, they're relying on receptor specificity, which is never 100%, and so off-target toxicity remains a problem. It's our view that for CNS cancers, this sort of direct targeted delivery is ideal. Uh, and I'll show you why in a moment, but it, it overcomes one of the key challenges of getting drugs to the CNS, and that's the blood-brain barrier. Next slide. So as a, as a drug developer and thinking about uh, targeted radiotherapeutics for CNS cancers, we have this sort of simple model that we think about. You, you, you can divide the CNS cancers from, from this perspective into two things. There's the parenchymal disease, the, the disease, the cancer that's in the, in the brain and the spinal cord, the midbrain and, and so forth. Uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of one animal. The other animal is the fluid containing space. You could sort of divide cancers of the CNS uh, in, into you know, one of those two areas. And it just so happens we have two well-developed surgical procedures that allow us to get to the brain parenchyma or get to the cerebral spinal fluid. And we're gonna to focus today on brain parenchymal delivery for recurrent glioblastoma. Next slide. So I am sure we'll talk about how this looks from the patient perspective, but, um, but to, to just kind of simplify it, and I think specifically Dr. Floyd's gonna talk about this from, from a GBM perspective, is that the treatment planning is done prior to the patient coming in, and it's a couple of day procedure to get the uh, to get the drug infused, to get the catheters placed, to confirm that they have cancer, and they go home. And that's it's a short hospital stay relative to the alternative external beam radiation therapy, which is day after day radiation uh, visits to the hospital for for many weeks. As it relates to leptomeningeal cancer, treating the the, the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, that's actually a, a much simpler procedure. It ends up being about a five-minute injection in the clinic as an outpatient. Next slide, please. So uh, in the spirit of a picture is worth a thousand words, I, I like to show this because um, one of the key aspects of this drug that makes it unique is that it elaborates a gamma emission. So it allows you to see where the drug is and then quantify how much radiation you're getting to the tumor. And as, uh, as someone that's been doing translational medicine for a long time, and I've seen this over, I've seen this now over the course of the development of this drug, is that it allows us to iterate and to um, develop the drug in a much more accelerated fashion, because we look at each individual patient, we can make changes to uh, drug delivery, dose planning, and so forth to improve the. Um, uh, the, the outcomes of these patients in a very sort of rapid cycle fashion. Next slide. So then finally, let me just, uh, as a last slide, talk about the company's portfolio and uh, clinical pipeline. So we have three trials that will be ongoing fairly soon, uh, early next year when the third trial gets on board for malignant gliomas. We have a, um, a phase one that continues to enroll patients to maximum tolerated dose, which we have yet to reach. We're giving very high doses of radiation, but that phase one continues to explore both those doses and, and the size of tumors we can treat. We have an ongoing uh, phase two trial using a recommended phase two derived in the phase one, and that trial is roughly about half enrolled and, and should be fully enrolled by the end of 2024. And then, as I mentioned, the pediatric uh, brain cancer trial should be starting here in the, uh, in the next few months. We also have a leptomeningeal basket trial that's enrolling part, uh, 
part A of phase one is complete and we're now in part B of phase one. So next slide, please. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Patel, who's gonna talk specifically about convection enhanced delivery in neurosurgery. Dr. Patel. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Toral Patel. I'm a neurosurgeon at UT Southwestern. My uh, specialty is in the management of adult brain tumor patients, specifically um, eloquent location gliomas. And I'd like to speak to you about sort of the challenges in drug delivery to the brain and, and then more specifically about this technique called convection enhanced delivery. Next slide. So the this figure sort of nicely outlines the issue with um, getting drugs effectively into the brain. So this models the blood-brain barrier with blood on the uh, top of the slide, brain on the other side. And then when you are in the blood vessel, um, what the drug is seeing is this tight network of cells uh, that prevent the drug from getting into the brain space. And that tight network is uh, formed in large part by tight junctions between the endothelial cells. And so the ways that uh, drugs can get from the blood into the brain space are either through receptor-mediated transcytosis. So uh, a drug or a particle has a specific um, moiety on it that a receptor will recognize, or through absorptive-mediated transcytosis, like clathrin-coated pits, et cetera, um, that lets you transcytose through the cell. These methods and these, um, these uh, movements are relatively inefficient, and so you will reduce the concentration of drug in the brain by several logfold, um, relying solely on um, uh, intravenous delivery of medications. Next slide, please. Because of this, people have been investigating for several decades now methods to directly infuse drug into the brain. And uh, that method, uh, in short, is called convection enhanced delivery or CED. The figure in the top right um, of, the, of the screen over to the far right shows what happens if you put a catheter into the brain and then just quickly uh, inject all of the drug um, immediately without any sort of pressure gradient. And what happens is that you get a very high drug concentration immediately at the uh, site of the infusion, but the fall off is very rapid. And so the distribution local regionally is poor. By delivering things via convection enhanced delivery, that bottom figure, uh, which involves a specific catheter design uh, to prevent backflow of the infusate and then also a specific um, uh, gradation in the uh, flow through the catheter, you can get a square-shaped concentration concentration curve where you maintain very high concentrations, but you can distribute them over large volumes uh, with a volume of distribution over a volume of infusion approximating five, which is considered ideal. And so you get a square shaped curve. These particles and drugs move through bulk flow instead of just passive diffusion. Next slide. And so what this might look like is if you had a convection enhanced delivery of a nanoparticle and the top two figures and you just infused free drug via a catheter, then you would move that free drug over a, loss, a large period of uh, a large volume of brain. But immediately after the infusion, that free drug would slowly um, and relatively rapidly disappear. But if you took that free drug and then encapsulated it into a nanoparticle and then delivered it again via the same convection enhanced delivery setup, you would get a good local regional delivery of the infusate as modeled by those green particles. But then because the particles slowly release the drug, and this can be engineered to anywhere between two to six to eight weeks, depending on the particle formulation, you'll get say, sustained large volume and uh, long period of time drug delivery to that part of the brain. Next paragraph, or next slide. These, um, these technological improvements have really addressed the issues with the precise trial, which uh, those in the audience might remember was published over a dozen years ago now, but it was a large phase three randomized trial of convection enhanced delivery of an IL-13 conjugated pseudomonas exotoxin versus gliadel for recurrent GBM. And there was a lot of promise for this trial, but ultimately the, the trial showed parity to gliadel wafers. 
And the issue is really one of drug, drug distribution. The catheters that were used in that trial did not have the appropriate uh, design for, for good convection. And so the drug moved largely via passive diffusion and had that very steep concentration gradient right next to the catheter, but very poor local regional delivery, which explains the failure. Next slide. Since that study, there's been uh, rapid developments in, um, in catheter design and Brain Lab uh, acquired a company, MR Interventions, which developed this catheter, which we were developing at the same time in lab, uh, that has a very important step, step down uh, design that allows for um, good convection infusion without backflow and the ability to get that square shaped curve. Next slide. This is what the tip of the catheter looks like. It's a ceramic coated catheter. And then as you can see at the tip, there's a step down and that step down um, along the last five millimeters of the tip of the catheter remarkably changes the type of infusion that you get. If you have only one caliber of catheter the whole way through, the infusate will just zoom up the back of the catheter tract and you won't get distribution into the parenchyma, but this kind of step down um, remarkably changes that uh, profile. I will say on the prior slide, the remainder of the setup for placing uh, one of these catheters in the brain for convection enhanced delivery was uh, shown. And I've done a dozen of these cases now. And um, the sort of learning curve is uh, quick and pretty easy. The standard neurosurgeon should be able to handle this. Next slide. And the way that we put these catheters in in our operating room and, and also in, in Dr. Floyd's operating room is using a system called uh, VarioGuide, which is a frameless stereotactic system that Brain Lab makes uh, through which you can uh, stereotactically place these catheters. Each catheter placement takes about 10 to 15 minutes and so not an overly uh, burdensome period of time. Next slide. I'll hand it over to Drs. Brenner and Floyd. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Floyd, neurosurgery, specialized in neurosurgical oncology at UT Health San Antonio. I've uh, been there for 16 years now, working alongside Dr. Brenner as well. And I'll, I'll go through part of our early phase one trial and some of the lessons learned. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the setup for the phase one dose escalation trial. Um, I'll just make a note here that Prior to this trial starting, um, we did a FDA approved animal study in a, in a good lab practices laboratory in Matawan, Michigan to um, prove that it's safe before going into humans. This is our first in human trial. And so really one of the remarkable things about this trial is that it's first in human, but yet now we have a lot of human experience. And this started in first case cohort one in 2016. This is an FDA trial with a dose escalation paradigm where each cohort has uh, three patients. We start off with very small volumes of treatment uh, of tumor volume and then small uh, injections of rhenium. As you can see there, the first injection cohort was not even one ML and not even one CC. So these are very small volumes and very small targets. That was for the first uh, several cohorts of, of patients. And some of the lessons that we learned, you know, through the progression of this trial was that um, we were doing certain techniques with glass syringes and using intraoperative CT scans and certain, certain uh, procedures to be as accurate as possible. As we escalated through the trial and treating larger volumes, we were able to then adopt more standard neurosurgical techniques. And, um, as we got to cohort six, we're treating a, a larger volume of tumor up to 20 cc's. And, uh, and then now we're still completing the, the uh, cohort eight uh, now. Um, we're still looking at what is the exact maximum tolerated dose. So we still are analyzing some of our data from cohort seven and eight. Um, during this time, we have increased the volume that we are injecting 25 times. With increased volume, we are using 
more catheters. So in the beginning of the cohort, we started with one catheter injection. And now it's not uncommon to utilize four catheters from different trajectories to ensure that we cover the entirety of the tumor. And the radiation dose has increased by 40 times as well. On the right hand side, you'll see a chart breaking down the um, demographics of our patients. We've had 28 patients that we have treated. Again, this is the first 28 patients in human. And so we have 18, uh, 18 male, 10 female. The average volume of tumor is 11 cc's, with the uh, going from very small volume of 0.88 cc's to 33 cc's being the largest volume treated so far. Some of the molecular status is shown there in the table. Uh, we can go through that later, but there's uh, a, a variety of molecular um, uh, alterations in our patients. And in the early part of the trial, we allowed grade three uh, malignant glioma to um, participate. That was in the first, uh, uh, first three cohorts. We also allowed um, avastin failure patients to also enter the trial. Uh, this was uh, changed after uh, several cohorts and to where it's just pre-avastin failure and grade four diagnosis. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so how, how do we identify patients and, and what is the workflow? Well, patients are seen in your multidisciplinary neuro-oncology clinics. Um, they are uh, they're screened to see if they are surgical candidates. Uh, we look through um, if, it's, if there's any exclusion criteria. And if they're if they're screened and consented and want to proceed with the trial, we obtain our pre-surgical MRI. Now, this is a standard pre-surgical MRI. This is not, we do have some, some research features in the trial uh, MRI scan, but it's a standard acquisition that any neurosurgeon would use across the country for stereotactic surgery. Within the, that MRI, we're able to upload it into our planning software with Brain Lab and plan the uh, personalized a treatment plan, which is a trajectory optimized to enter the tumor and deliver the nanoparticles into the tumor. Uh, this is an important part of the, of the treatment planning. Um, we have to avoid certain brain structures, and it's a uh, it's something that we do centralized uh, currently, but um, it's easily adaptable to a stereotactic neurosurgeon's practice. And the brain uh, flexible seek. A catheter is what we have been utilizing, as Dr. Patel mentioned. This has really been a breakthrough for us. I, I participated in some of the early trials utilizing a non-convection therapy catheter, and those, those failed miserably. That was in the early 2000s. And so this really has revolutionized the ability to deliver uh, catheter-based infusions into the brain. So patients go to the we do a standard care biopsy. It's important that we have to confirm that there's recurrent tumor. Once we have confirmed that with our neuropathologist, then the catheters are immediately then placed, as Dr. Patel had mentioned, and patients uh, go back to recovery. They get a standard post-operative head CT scan. Everything looks good. They go back to their room, and then the following day, the infusion is, is performed. Can you go to the next slide, please? This was our this was our very first patient that we ever treated. This was in 2016. This scan just shows uh, our planning software, and there is an enhancing portion of the tumor that is outlined in orange, and then blue is the catheter planning uh, that took place uh, before the uh, treatment. Now. With our software, we can plan around certain structures such as resection cavities, CSF spaces, surface blood vessels, uh, important eloquent brain. We can map out sensory motor portions of the brain, and we can plan a trajectory that optimizes placement of the nanoparticle in the tumor while avoiding critical structures of the brain. Next slide, please. And then this is just a, a 3D uh, rendition of the planning superimposed on the uh, scalp, on the uh, skin map. 
so we can see exactly where the catheter will be placed. And all this is done, again, before we even go into the operating room. Again, on this one, the 3D rendition, the, the, the orange is the tumor. The blue catheter you can see uh, entering the tumor. The dark blue around it is peritumoral edema around the tumor. And then that lighter blue beneath it is the resection cavity. So these are all a visual representation of our, of our procedure. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is what it looks like. So this is minimally invasive. We don't have to open up previous surgical incisions. We don't have to remove previous bone flaps. Um, it's a single, this, this is the early part of the trial. So this was a single catheter injection through a small three millimeter incision of the skin and the skull bolt holding the catheter in place. Patient's very comfortable during the infusion. As we treated larger volumes, uh, instead of one catheter, there would be two or three, sometimes four catheters, but it looks very similar to this, and they usually are, are relatively close together. You can see that there's a, the larger catheter you can see there is actually an outer shell, and the infusion catheter is inside of that one. Um, next slide, please. So on the phase one summary, uh, to date, we have had uh, 28 patients in the dose escalation and eight cohorts. Um, we looking at the tolerability and safety of the phase one. We saw that this was very well tolerated by patients. Most adverse events were just grade one or two grade. The most common being headache and fatigue. Most adverse events that we observed during the course of the phase one study were actually uh, unlocked unlikely to be related to the drug and most likely related to disease progression. We had no evidence at all of systemic radiation toxicity. And we really have not found the dose limiting maximum tolerated uh, dose. And we're still looking to analyze our data from cohort eight. But during the interim, uh, interim analysis of our phase one trial, based on the data, we elected to proceed with the phase two at the medium-sized tumors of limiting it to 20 uh, cc's tumor with an, uh, a dose of 22.3 millicuries and an 8.8 ml volume. And we're currently enrolling into that trial. And I'll turn over to Dr. Brenner, who can um, walk us through the phase two part. Thanks, Dr. Floyd. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So in phase two, as mentioned, we uh, moved forward with uh, treating uh, with our cohort six uh, dose, which was 8.8 uh, .8 millicuries um, of RNL um, and in a volume of 22.3 mLs. Um, as of uh, currently, we have a total of 15 patients at the phase two um, uh, dose that have been treated. Uh, you can see their distribution there on the right, um, a slight male predominance. Uh, the tumor volume has been from approximately 1 ml all the way up to 23 mLs, um, and they represent the targeted patient population that we're looking for in phase two, which is glioblastoma, um, which should all be IDH wild type, um, and then in terms of methylation status, um, uh, almost evenly, slightly uh, more methylated than non-methylated, but almost even in terms of eight versus seven patients, um, and then they should all be uh, grade four, as you see there. Next slide. There's an example of one of our patients um, enrolled in phase two. Uh, you can see uh, in the top image there on the right, the spec images. So that basically showing us our drug distribution. There is the various isodose lines, which uh, kind of um, basically tell us uh, where the uh, different levels of radiation were administered. Um, so, you know, basically looking at the green line is our, is our volume of distribution um, for the therapeutic in this particular case. Uh, whereas below it, you see the, um, on the second row, you see the pretreatment imaging, and then at various times thereafter to see how we basically were able to cover the tumor in this case. Um, uh, in terms of uh, this patient, again, since this is the phase two, uh, as 20, we uh, uh, administered 22.3 uh, millicuries and 8.8 mLs, the total uh, tumor volume in this case was 9.9 .9 mLs, and we got approximately 70% coverage. Absorbed dose to the total tumor was about 353 gray, and this patient remains alive uh, with all the 
enhancement changes within the uh, treatment volume as well one might expect. Next slide. Here's another example uh, of a patient that was treated. Um, this uh, tumor um, is slightly smaller. You can see there the, um, uh, the uh, uh, top left corner, the pretreatment uh, imaging, and then the drug distribution. And then at the various time points below, you can also see the um, distribution lines. Um, we tend to see enhancement develop within the treatment field. And I'm gonna kind of go over this a little bit more later, but within that treatment field, we can uh, see some uh, increased enhancement for them first from the infusion itself, um, which uh, tends to stabilize over a period of time. Um, and in this case, uh, the volume was 3.5 mLs. We received, uh, were able to achieve 99% coverage. Uh, the total dose to the tumor was uh, approximately 740 gray. So quite a bit of coverage to the tumor uh, here in terms of dose. Um, this patient remains alive with a survival of 946 days. Um, next slide. So we have uh, treated uh, 15 patients to date. Um, we haven't seen any significant uh, change in terms of safety signals during the phase two. Uh, it continues to be uh, safe and well tolerated. There's no evidence of systemic radiation toxicity. Um, and these patients were able to very closely uh, determine dose to any outside organs because we are getting whole body planar imaging. And so we can see any radioactive um, distribution outside of the tumor, uh, including to distant organs. And we don't see any significant signal of, um, of uh, uh, radiation activity uh, out and out and, uh, external organs. Uh, 13 out of 15 patients, or about 87%, received uh, our cutoff, our threshold of greater than 100 gray. Um, uh, that we uh, have determined is to be kind of our cutoff both, on, both based on preclinical uh, experiments as well as uh, what we observed in phase one. It continues enrolling. Um, you can see there on the right, the average absorbed dose in this um, uh, group of patients was about uh, a little over 300 gray, and we're getting uh, good coverage with about 87% coverage. Now, it's important to keep in mind when we say 87% coverage, that means to the 100 gray isodose line, that does not mean that areas outside of that are not still also receiving coverage. In terms of the, the uh, adverse effects, um, uh, you can see the distribution of them. They're almost all grade one, uh, with, a few, uh, with about a quarter of them being grade two, very few grade three. Uh, grade three. Uh, the typical ones that we're seeing are headache and fatigue. This is identical to what we saw in phase one. So no new safety signals there. Next slide. And then when we look at these patients to try and get an idea of how they're doing in terms of survival, um, you can see their uh, median progression free survival there on the left and their overall survival on the right. Um, this is from the phase one. And you can see um, that uh, on the right, when we looked um, at the uh, survival by a less than or 100 gray, um, you see that the patients who had greater than 100 gray had a significantly improved survival compared to the ones with less than 100 gray. Um, the uh, 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 patients who had a, a greater than 100 gray uh, had a significantly improved overall survival of approximately, um, uh, oh, so I'm sorry, we're still in progression-free survival here. My, my apologies. So you see that the, regression, the median progression-free survival was uh, at uh, six months versus uh, the patients less than 100 gray at two months. Next slide. Here's the survival. So uh, all patients on the left here from uh, cohort one through cohort um, uh, eight. So you can see that the um, uh, uh, median overall survival was approximately 11 months, which is better than what is described uh, for the um, uh, patient population. Uh, recurrent glioblastoma uh, typically has a survival of around eight to nine months. And then the um, median overall survival, when we look by uh, absorption uh, level, uh, less than 100 gray or greater than 100 gray, you can see less than 100 gray there in blue and then greater than 100 gray in red. And we're seeing a um, median overall survival um, for those patients uh, who uh, had greater than 100 gray, uh, approximately uh, 17 months. So uh, again, significantly better than what you would expect uh, for this patient population where the median overall survival is eight to nine months. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, and here's the phase two data of where we stand. It's still very early. It's important to note that a lot of these patients remain either progression-free uh, or uh, alive. And so um, it's challenging to uh, uh, to say what the median actually will be, um, uh, but this is a censored uh, for that at this time. You can see um, on the left, the progression-free survival, and we are at about uh, at um, uh, 11 months of uh, progression-free survival uh, for these patients. Um, and then the overall survival there on the right, again, heavily censored because we have a number of these patients still alive. Um, and uh, it is uh, right now at um, 13 months. Next slide. And then uh, we tried to uh, analyze the images to um, better predict um, you know, what was happening and, and trying to understand um, uh, where uh, we were doing well or not doing well. And in this case, what we did is we took both the MRI images as well as the SPECT images which show our radiation activity and we combined them together into a single analysis. For the SPECT images, which you saw on the top before when I was showing you where you see the, the color maps, we took those and we uh, extracted from them the areas uh, of interest, which defined a dose of 100 gray or more. And we generate these, uh, these uh, uh, volume uh, areas, and then we extract those. And then on the MRI, we take um, the uh, enhancing uh, uh, area, which we uh, 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 would um, think to be tumor, and we uh, take out uh, those and subtract out from anything that's not enhancing to get a tumor map. And then we're able to look at blood flow to the tumor using something called dynamic successfully contrast imaging or perfusion imaging. And we can look at what is the amount of blood flow to the uh, area there. And we combine this all into one uh, statistical analysis. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just an example of our treatment maps. So in this case, this is a patient who had very high level of tumor coverage. Um, the uh, area in red indicates everything that received a dose of 100 gray or more. So um, this patient had very good coverage and in fact did very well. So um, uh, still alive um, almost uh, three years later, as you can see on the left side. Um, next slide. And when we look at over time, what we see is, um, is uh, uh, these values on the graph on the left. So to explain this graph, if we see increase in enhancement uh, outside of our treatment area, then the curves go up. If we see increase in enhancement within our treatment area, then the graphs go down. So basically this is asking the question, where is the increase in enhancement coming from in these patients or do you see an increase in enhancement? And so uh, each individual patient is color labeled there. And so these are uh, uh, paired tumor volume differences by day of untreated versus treated volumes. And what you see is you have some patients, as you see there at the day 28 uh, time point, where ha which have an increase of enhancement within the tumor volume. That's not terribly unexpected. We often call that pseudo progression, but then that stabilizes because it doesn't continue to go down. Matter of fact, what you see is, is that any enhancement that occurs thereafter tends to be really outside of the um, of the treatment volume. And so when we ask statistically uh, the question, um, what we uh, the answer is, is that the untreated tumor volume was significantly increased compared to the treated tumor volume. So we're actually basically um, able to say statistically that in the area that we treat, we get good control. And in the area that we miss, we get less than ideal control. Next slide. So uh, in summary, uh, Reem abyssal is uh, generally safe and well tolerated with no evidence of uh, systemic radiation toxicity in any treated patient. We're, uh, uh, admiss we have administered up to 41.5 millicuries and 16.3 milliliters. Um, we're um, able to, uh, with better treatment planning and patient selection, reproducibly deliver uh, drug levels that are, uh, cover um, uh, what we're looking for in terms of the 100 gray and uh, greater than 70% coverage with 80% of the patients in phase two that are at or above that target and likely we'll be able to continue improving on that. Um, absorbed doses of the tumor greater than 100 gray and tumor uh, treatment percentage greater than 70% strongly correlate with increased overall survival. 
and mid-trial analysis phase two data, including feasibility, safety, and efficacy is consistent with the phase one patients receiving greater than 100 gray. Next slide. At this point, uh, I'll turn it back over to Tara, and uh, we'll, I think uh, the plan is to move forward with question and answers here. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenner. Uh, at this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session with our speakers. As a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to submit a question, please use the Q&A text box at the bottom of the webcast player. Please hold for a brief moment while we pull for questions. So our first question comes from Justin Walsh from Jones Trading. Please go ahead, Justin. Hi, thanks for uh, for taking the, uh, the the questions here. Um, so maybe just from a from a broad perspective here for the, uh, the the physicians on based on the results that we've seen so far, how likely do you believe uh, it is that the treatment is providing a clinic uh, clinically meaningful benefit to patients? I'm happy to handle this, but maybe my colleagues can chime in. I think. Um, I think that our imaging analysis, you know, we, we really have done, tried to get as much information on these cases as possible to understand what's going on. Um, and I think in a number of different ways that we've looked at it. So we've done modeling uh, where we've asked the statisticians to look at all the different factors um, from these patients that we've treated so far in terms of their tumor size, the um, their demographics, their age, um, and then the, the amount of coverage we have, the amount of dose we have, everything. And so in that modeling, one thing consistently comes out. Um, age is an important factor for survival. That's something we've always known. It's not a factor for progression. Um, tumor volume in our trial is really not, uh, does not statistically come out as an important factor. Um, and, you know, tumor size is a known factor. And so something is mitigating that. Uh, that that aspect of it. Um, but with the highest statistical um, degree of certainty, uh, the absorbed dose and the uh, percent coverage repetitively come out as a um, as a hazard factor for survival and, and and progression as well. So what that's saying is is that treatment is impacting survival and progression. So, uh, and these patients that have very good coverage, they have a longer survival. Um, and patients who don't have good coverage, they have a worse survival. And then on top of that, as I showed you in the imaging data, the imaging also says that if there's going to be some increase, it's going to come outside of the treatment field. And if there's going to be uh, a good control, it's going to come within the treatment field. So I think I, I I have no problem saying that in those patients who you get good coverage, you get good survival, which means that is a that means that there is activity of the agent um, and 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 should translate to clinical benefit. Uh, ultimately, phase three clinical trials are what's required to say with certainty that you are. Uh, improving the standard of care for patients. We don't have phase three data, so we have to lean on what we have. I think saying that this data is supportive that um, that a pivotal trial uh, needs to happen uh, is there, but we have to complete the phase two. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question. I think I've answered the best way I can. It's really hard while you're doing clinical trials to make definitive statements, but I think that's as close as I can get. Great, yeah, that that's perfect. Um, so my next question, I'm wondering if you've seen any any indications of or concern over uh, dose to the healthy brain in the uh, immediate area around the the tumor. I, I know you've mentioned that the sort of the better tumor coverage you get, the uh, I guess the 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 better the the outcome for the patient. Um, but of course, it's it's a beta therapy, so I'm sure that there. Uh, there's at least some concern that that you could have damage to uh, to surrounding uh, tissues. I see Toral nodding her head. Yes, so I, maybe I'll let her answer this in terms of what her experience has been. Yeah, it's an excellent question, uh, and and certainly I have that same concern. Our radiation oncologists have that same concern, um, and we have seen 
edema irritation of the surrounding brain. And I would expect that. I think that if you're not seeing that something's wrong with how the therapeutics being delivered. Um, in all cases, we've been able to rescue that with a short course of steroids or Avastin. And I think that that will likely be a part of this treatment uh, for recurrent GBM if there's been a backbone of radiation previously, which would be the case in basically every patient. Um, but there is some inflammatory effects. They have been temporary transient, again, able to be rescued and treated with medications, but they do require attention. Great, thanks. So my next question here, I, I'm wondering if you can just uh, remind us and, and provide some more color on the, the thinking that went into the selection of the, the recommended phase two dose and uh, and the, the continued dose escalation, and maybe how your the, the learnings from the phase two might inform a, a potential dose and design for a, a, a pivotal trial. Uh, I'm happy to to start that off, and I'm sure anybody can 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 contribute to this. So, you know, one thing that we saw was that the, the area that we were treating was adequately treated. And so we didn't really feel strongly that an increase in the concentration of the drug, in other words, packing more radiation into the same area, was really going to push the envelope very much. We had already um, done increases in concentration. Um, and so what we really were trying to do with the dose escalation was to get better coverage. So we were leaving the concentration static, but administering a greater dose in the hopes of getting greater distribution. So giving so while the concentration was static, both the amount of dose administered and the volume is administered in increased. Um, when we got to cohort six, we were seeing very good results, very good safety. Um, and so um, and so the uh, you know, the idea was is that, here we have some signs of efficacy. And if we know we're gonna go up, we're just gonna be covering larger tumors, but this doesn't preclude us from treating tumors that we know we can cover, cover now in the phase two. And then if we experience any, uh, any uh, toxicity that would be uh, dose limiting, then we would, in, in subsequent cohorts, higher dose levels, we could always either just not pursue those, or if we see larger coverage uh, with higher doses be applicable, we can always add those in later. So um, given the excellent results through cohort six, we thought it made sense to go ahead and begin accruing in the phase two. We did present this to the FDA and, and they did agree with us, but the FDA also did want us to, to look at uh, higher volumes, higher dose levels, and to continue to, to determine the, um, the MTD. So that was kind of the logic there. We could have waited and explored larger volumes and waited and just included all, all larger volumes in the phase two. But we can all, it didn't really seem to make a lot of sense since we knew that we had plenty of patients with these size tumors that we could still treat um, in the phase two. And then we could always add in larger volumes later if we cleared them in the phase one. Got it, thanks. Last question for me. Um, maybe you could just comment and, and remind us if this, treatment uh, was not available, what, what trajectory would you expect for these patients and, and what would their alternative uh, therapies look like? Sorry, does anybody else want to handle that? I don't want to hog all the questions. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll, my, I'll take a stab at that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So in, in our you know, most patients then would be, you know, screened for other other potential clinical trials um, that your your cancer institution locally may have available for the patients. There's other FDA approved therapies for recurrences. There's tumor treatment fields, Optune, and then there are second line uh, systemic therapies with bevacizumab and lamustine. But in in general, the you know the the options are are limited, um, but they would go down you know, additional pathways for those uh, secondary treatment plans. 
I'll I'll add a little bit to that. In terms of a current GBM, we 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 have a number of challenges. First of all, even the only the, the drug that we use most commonly in the uh, in salvage setting is a fast and map, and that is not even shown a survival benefit. We mainly use that as a palliative drug. We're trying to delay the onset of symptoms, but we don't make people live longer. We might improve their quality of life initially, right? But even in those patients that have a response, which radiographically they 30 to 40% improve, the duration of that response is only about four or five months. So whether you use a fasten or not, the survival in multiple, multiple, we've done a lot of studies on this setting, and none of them have pushed the needle and remains you know, between eight and nine months. So we have nothing, zero, zip, as of right now, that improves survival in the second line setting after failure of conventional therapy. So. Thanks. Um, Justin, anything else from you? You said that was the last question, so I'm assuming it is. And we will leave it at that for Justin. Um, we'll now move to, we've got a lot of incoming written questions. So thank you for those, and hopefully we can get to everything. Um, I'm going to start with a question about systemic toxicity. And the question is, um, why haven't we seen any systemic toxicity given these very high levels of radiation? Dr. Yeah, can... Go ahead, Dr. Floyd. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, any of us can, can chime in on this one. Um, you know, we, we know that from our pre-human FDA trial and, and also from our early experience um, in, our, in our cohort, in our um, phase one trial, when the rhenium nanoparticles are placed into the tumor, the retention is excellent. It, 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 re, it is retained by the tumor, and we can see that over time with our SPECT CT imaging. And then when it does eventually um, get cleared from the CNS, it goes through rapidly and cleared through the urine and out of the body. And so through, through our, our preclinical and clinical trials, uh, we have studied uh, bone marrow toxicity. We studied liver, thyroid, um, kidney, bladder, you know, the uh, all potential systemic toxicities. And there's just, there just is a negligible amount of radiation that ever reaches any other end organ. I don't know if you wanted to add on to that, Dr. Brenner or Dr. Patel, but it's cleared pretty quickly. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can say I totally agree with Doctor what Doctor Floyd said. That the main thing is is that whatever is not retained rapidly clears out through the through the mainly through the urine. So, um, so there's not really anything left outside of what's trapped in the tumor um, in the brain uh, to really cause any toxicity. I think that covers that one. Um, next question gets to the the PFS that you observed, the the new data showing from this phase to a, a progression free survival of, of eleven months, and compared to the published overall survival in all previous studies that you kind of alluded to around eight months, that looks really encouraging. Um, the question is more how likely is that to hold up? in a larger phase three, or is there something specific about your center that's driving that improved progression survival than what might be expected? And well, I'd say that's an excellent question. Um, you, you know, the, the real trick here is to, um, I think, make sure that what you're doing is easily uh, transferable to other institutions. If it's a matter of just institutional expertise only that is able to achieve this, then it's just not going to be good for anybody. But I think um, Dr. Patel did a great job, so did Dr. Floyd, of kind of, you know, how we do it. And how we do it isn't some uh, mystery voodoo magic. I mean, it's 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 really based in science and and development of techniques that have really impacted the field. Um, having a local therapy 
that is highly efficacious um, is only as good as being able to place it. And so we're continuing to work on that to make it as easy as possible. There's a number of different things that we are doing to, to, to do that. Number one, as we mentioned, the, the imaging that we're doing, we're going to try and make that available to the investigators early on so they can see how we did. And then, you know, there is the potential of going back. And if we have a case where we don't get good coverage about, you know, putting another catheter in there and treating an area that we missed. So, you know, this is going to be in development. I mean, there's absolutely, there's never guarantees when you're doing clinical development, but, um, but certainly we have to do everything we can to make this uh, as easy as possible to expand um, to other institutions. Um, so far, I don't see any major impediments in that. It seems to be, as Dr. Patel and Dr. Floyd both, uh, I think, well um, stated, I think it's really the, the techniques um, are within the, um, the ca capacity of most uh, academic centers in the U.S. I, I think that it's a good transition to the next question. I kind of already answered it, but maybe have Dr. Floyd and Patel chime in, and that is, the, the procedure seems simple from what you've presented, but how specialized is the convection enhanced delivery procedure and how much learning would be required if the product were eventually approved and available more broadly in the US? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, speaks to how generalizable this uh, surgical technique is. I think that any neurosurgeon that knows how to do a stereotactic biopsy can put in one of these catheters. And that's certainly um, bread and butter neurosurgery and part of everybody's neurosurgical training. So there is a little bit of fiddle factor to understand how to put the bolt in uh, the first time, but after you've done it two, three, four times, it's pretty straightforward. Dr. Floyd, anything to add to that? I, I agree with Dr. Patel. Um, you know, our, our goal through the early phase one trial was to um, not do, get away from anything that was institutional special, you know, that we could only do at this institution and we're doing it here to make it work. Um, anything that we had started utilizing early in the, in the trial, we got away from to more standardized neurosurgical technique with the in, intentionally being intentional about it, about being able to generalize this procedure across the country. And so I, I agree with Dr. Patel. It's 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 the learning curve is is relatively fast for you know for this procedure. Thanks. Next question has to do with the dose that's being used in phase two. It says I know you're using 22 millicaries in phase two, um, but if you still haven't found any MTD from phase one, might it still be possible? to go even higher in dose and any evidence from cohort seven and eight that you're getting any be better coverage or efficacy yet? Dr. Uh, uh, yeah, I can, I can start and others can chime in. So uh, uh, that the, the specific intent of continuing dose escalation was to see if those could be added to the phase two. So, um, so yes, there's the possibility that we could use higher doses to treat larger tumors, really. That's the goal, um, to expand the, 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 um, the number of patients that can benefit from this. But um, we still have to process that data. And, you know, um, I really don't want to comment on it because we're still gathering all the, the, the toxicity data and everything. And that really requires a formal analysis for us to comment on that. But yes, it's possible. Um, and if cohort eight doesn't work, but we go back and we see cohort seven looks really good, we could always expand cohort seven and say, no, we're not going to do cohort eight dose, but we're going to do cohort seven dose, for example. So, um, so, so yes, is the summary. Um, there's another question having to do with the, the, the population size of patients with recurrent GBM and what percent of those patients are represented by these tumor sizes of 20 cc's or less in the, the phase two? Is it 50%, 80%? I can I can take a stab at this and, and please, uh, you and my colleagues, jump in. Um, when we're looking at screening for our conviction therapy trial, 
you know, they're not all patients would be eligible for convection therapy. So it may depend on the overall shape of the recurrence and even to an extent the location of the recurrence if it's if it's uh, progressing in in an, in an area that's what we call deep gray matter or, or portions of the brain that um, that may not tolerate uh, intervention or if it's potentially um, co-located around a large resection cavity or CSF space so there are some constraints and it's you know there are patients who may not necessarily qualify who go on to other other therapies but to, to have the exact number of of um of patients who who do go on it's, it's hard to answer that question i don't have a percentage there dr patel do you have a, a feeling on that yeah i think that that is hard to quantify i think um if you're imaging often enough every patient at some point will have a less than 20 cc recurrence before they have a greater than 20 cc recurrence. And so you could capture them all. Um, but many times you, you know, in your Q2 month surveillance imaging, you may, you may not capture uh, that interval, but if you were really aggressive about screening for trials like this, and you could image more often and find more patients. Um, but I think that the bigger issue is not going to be volume, but going to be one of size, shape, and location of the recurrence next to sulci ventricles and big CSF spaces. Are these um, physically appropriate lesions for convection? All right, um, next question is, I see you're getting almost 90% of patients treated at your target dose uh, of greater than 70% and over 100 gray. And that's much better than in the phase one, right? So is that a function of just a higher administered volume and dose, or is it more of improved technique and learning? Similar to the question we asked earlier. Yeah, I, I can oh. comment a little bit about that. So first of all, when we started with this study, we didn't know our volume of distribution. We were working on a number of different things, convection rate, how fast we were administering it, and could we get you know better coverage? The number of catheters where we were using, working with both bevacizumab um, naive and treated patients, which we learned later that it affected the flow. There were a lot of different things we were learning about the drug itself in terms of administering it. So there was a learning curve, right? We started off never having given this to a human before, um, not knowing. If we gave one ml, would it go to one ml? Would it go to three ml? Would it go to five ml? You know, what shape would the convection look like? Lots of different things there. You know, how close could we get to the ventricle? How far? We had cases of leakage, things like that. Okay, so once you know those things, then you can do a better job going forward. So that's that. That's number one. The other thing is, is we also learned how much we could cover. So when we say tumors less than twenty milliliters for phase two. The reason is, is because we know we can get an approximately 30 ml convection volume. So that means that when you do that, as long as you place the catheters in the right spot, that you should be able to cover a tumor. So I think it's really um, those factors that went into it. And uh, Dr. Patel and Floyd were, were there, so they can comment further, uh, I believe. No, I, I, I agree completely you said. Um, next one's an interesting question, uh, a little bit of a different topic, and, and would this be useful for brain metastases, maybe after patients have failed stereotactic radiosurgery or SRS, and are there any clinical trials being contemplated in this setting, anything new coming out of the SNOW conference on this front? <laughs> That's a great question. One of, uh, the, one of our uh, peers who's a leader in and exactly that, in, in terms of uh, radio surgery, um, uh, actually wa was at our investigators meeting and made the point, like, why aren't you going after brain metastases after SRS? Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's been some contemplation in that regard. So we are contemplating that, but uh, there is no formal study planned right now. 
but I certainly see that 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 could be a patient population that could benefit. If SRS isn't working and they have recurrence at the same site, you have limited uh, things that you can do. You can go back and re-resect. You can go back and re-radiate, but when you re-radiate, there's a lot high chance for, for necrosis, um, symptomatic necrosis. So this might do a lot better than that. Anything else on that? If not, um, this one looks like it's for Dr. Brenner asking to elaborate more on what was meant by pseudo progression that you mentioned in your prepared remarks and how obispa meta plays into that. Yeah, so this is a, uh, a something that we've been working or, or trying to understand the concept of pseudo progression for you know uh, almost two decades now. So um, when you give radiation, you can have patients that have an increase in enhancement, and it's, indis it's sometimes indistinguishable from the tumor itself. When we did studies with, M with um, uh, temozolomide, the alkylator that we currently use, we saw that actually increase. Um, and those patients who had this increased enhancement that can look like the tumor growing, um, they actually do better overall than their peers. So what happens is they get increased enhancement, but then it doesn't go anywhere. It just stays there and then starts to get better or gets no worse. And um, and those patients, um, they uh, tend to exhibit um, better outcomes than their peers. So it's been a real challenge over the years to, to define that. What is pseudoprogression? What is truly cancer growth? And what is the effects of radiation or immunotherapy or numerous other things that can make things look worse when in actuality, what you're looking at isn't necessarily tumor. So we try and do a lot of different techniques to do that. Um, we use, I showed you perfusion as an example or the blood volume there. If something is dead, it shouldn't need blood vessel supply, right? Whereas if it's actively growing, it should have a blood vessel supply. So looking at perfusion is one way of doing it. There's another, other things like using, um, pet agents like radioactive, um, amino acids. Um, and then we have something called delayed contrast where we uh, play, uh, where, where we go back and do the scan about an hour and a half after the initial contrast was administered. And in that case, dead tissue tends to hold on to the contrast, whereas live tissue, because of the blood vessels, it just speeds right through. So um, we're trying to do a good job of assessing for that. Um, there, We did see, as you saw there, um, in the first, at day 28, that within the treatment field, we did see increased enhancement, but it doesn't tend to go anywhere. OK, so it all stays within that treatment field and then it just kind of either stabilizes or improves. So so there is evidence that we're seeing some pseudo progression or or treatment effect within the treatment field, uh, which um, is important to distinguish from tumor growth and sometimes challenging to do so. Uh, next question. What is the reliability and reproducibility of the procedure? Uh, i.e. radiation delivery, you speak to things like case planning, catheter placement, drug delivery technique, et cetera. Who wants to tackle that one? Dr. Patel, you want to? Yeah, I, th I think I can maybe speak to that as I um, started the trial at UT Southwestern, um, but was not the um, home site and so can speak to some of the changes or differences that might exist from being at the parent site to um, to a satellite location. Uh, you know, the first um, treatment or two, Dr. Floyd came down or came up to Dallas and was in the OR to sort of offer some in-person guidance. I think that that would be critical to most sites uh, starting up, similar to other surgical uh, technologies that are new in the OR. Dr. Brenner and I always have a short call before the cases to discuss catheter plans, what we think the volume of coverage will be, what good trajectories are, and pick that together. Um, and I think that that kind of uh, workflow is essential to get a high quality treatment. I think that um, not putting that 10 or 15 minutes of effort in, which is not a lot, but is something, um, could result in a lack of reproducibility but I think it doesn't require more than that. And so each time you do a treatment, you need to plan it like any other surgical case. And um, the first couple of cases, you may need a surgeon who has previously put in these bolts to come teach you the small nuances of 
how not to cross thread something or, you know, small things that make a difference. Um, but every time you should be working with the oncologist on catheter plans and, and making sure that we're getting adequate volume. And that takes on the order of 10 to 15 minutes per case. Right. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, there's a couple of questions just about heterogeneity in the, the general population for RGBM and um, how heterogeneous, other than tumor size, are there other factors that play into how you may be able to predict a priori um, which types of, of patients may respond better to obese pomata within the recurrent population? Dr. Brenner? So the question is, is um, can we, within the GBM population, try and uh, decide who's going to be um, uh, yeah. who's going to be able to do well and who's not, I guess. Yeah. We, yeah we I mean, to this drug, right? Not just overall. Yeah. So, uh, you know what? That's really difficult to say. I think really um, where this goes, this works. I don't think any of us really, um, uh, really doubt that. I don't think that whether you're MGMT methylated, IDH mutated or anything else like that really makes a huge difference. I think really it's the anatomical features of the tumor more than it is actually the molecular features, right? And so as specifically as it relates to this drug, I don't think there's a lot. Now we are investigating those. We capture that data and we are always looking at it. A matter of fact, in the leptomeningeal studies, we're actually capturing the cells after treatment. And we're actually performing RNA sequencing on those cells to look and see what is happening biologically in these cells that are exposed to rhenium abysmata. But, um, but so as of now, I don't think we have any specific features or anything. I think it's all anatomic, honestly. Uh, okay. Uh, the last question that I can see here comes from Sean Lee of H.C. Wainwright. What are some of the challenges preventing this treatment from reaching an even higher tumor coverage um, in all the patients? Would centralized planning of the catheter placements help? That was kind of already addressed, but um, Dr. Floyd, do you want to elaborate on that one? Uh, sure. Um, well, we do. We do have centralized planning, and it's it is and it's a collaborative effort. Uh, you know, with with our um, our, our whole team with. Dr. Brenner, myself, Dr. Patel, and through a centralized planning, you know, software. So that's, you know, we are doing that. I, I think, I, I think that the, again, the limitations really would be the, the, the anatomical structure of the tumor, the shape, the irregularity. Um, there is a limit on how many catheters we should be, you know, we put it in. We, we've talked about this some degree um, by placing Multiple catheters, if you have three to four catheters, then we're more likely to be able to cover a larger area better. And should one catheter fail for one reason or another, we have a backup catheters. So we, 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 we believe that having additional catheters has helped uh, better coverage. Uh, but there still will be constraints of, of if it's very um, irregular shape of being able to to cover that full volume to 100 gray. And that's something that we are looking at. And with our planning software, we do have some simulation where we can run some simulations on the software and we can change the catheter trajectory to optimize coverage. And um, I think that's very helpful to take the time to run those simulations and maybe try, you know, we, we try two or three different um, placements and two, two or three different versions of catheter placement to get the best possible um, coverage, you know, in, in utilizing our simulation software and before surgery. I don't know if anybody else wants to add into that too. Anyone else anything to add? All right. Uh, I'll ask one more question and then turn it back to to Mark for some closing remarks. And this is probably best addressed by Dr. Prenner because it asks about the overall survival that you showed here and was uh, presented at Snow. 
Um, can you just confirm how the median OS was calculated for these 15 patients? It seems to exceed the length of time for the uh, that the trial has, has been in progress. And I think you alluded to that, that there are a number of patients still alive and that um, you're using censoring, but any comments on to the Kaplan-Meier curve and how it was calculated and where it's likely to go as more time progresses? Yeah, so for the phase two, we did include cohort six phase one patients, okay? Because they're being treated at exactly the same dose and everything's the same between the cohort six patients and the expanded, the, the addition of the additional patients that accrued on phase two. So you will see a range that is significantly longer because it includes the uh, cohort six patients. So um, so that partially answers it. But yeah, there is a lot of censoring there and it's standard uh, sta standard um, uh, Kaplan-Meier methods uh and and so um i you know i, I cannot i think i don't think there's any really fancy about the way we're doing it uh with standard Kaplan-Meier uh methods and log rank for for statistical significance okay great um those are all the the written and other questions we have coming in right now um, so thanks, everybody, for asking those. We'll be available for follow-up. Uh, on behalf of LifeSide, I'd like to thank our three KOLs, but turn it over to Mark for some more closing remarks. Yeah, what a great panel. Thanks, you guys. Uh, uh, Dr. Floyd, Dr. Patel, <laughs> Dr. Brenner, thank you for, for being here. But also, uh, I say a very big smile. I know how much work you guys have put in this in this program kind of behind the scenes going back many years in, in some cases. So it is really excited to see the, the safety and the feasibility and, 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 and potential efficacy here with this. And I ran in a, uh, I ran in a 5k with one of Dr. Patel's patients a few months back. And uh, <clears throat> that was, that was sort of transformative, not only just to, to be out there with them, but, but, Kind of what you know, he walked me through kind of how how the procedure was from a patient perspective. So we're super excited, and we thank you guys. And you you represent your staffs that have done so much work in the nuclear medicine suite and in the OR and in the clinic. And you know, we we really thankful for them and thankful for the patients that um, that, that trust us in implementing these kind of very uh, very innovative therapies. So. Thanks, you guys, very much, and thanks to you that are on the call, that ask the questions, and, and are listening. We really, really appreciate that. Thanks so much. That's all I have to say, Corey.